Welcome back, everybody. My name is Jason Gilmet, and you're listening to UAP Studies Podcast. Today, we have our boy, Michael Glosson, who is joining us. He's going to be co-hosting with us today. How are you doing, Hey, Mike? Jason. Oh, I'm doing great over here. Sweating in the Charleston sun, but uh, we have the air conditioner blasting, so... Yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to fall. I'm more of a fall guy myself. I'm I have Same. the complexity of snow, so you know the colder <laughs> temperatures are better for me for sure. Uh, today we have Robert Powell who is joining us, uh, and it's awesome to have Robert on. Uh, he gave us a great bio, but I, I just sort of trimmed it down really quickly because Robert's going to fill us in on uh, some of his life uh, and and his work, of course. So Robert is a founding board member of the Scientific Coalition for UAP Studies, also known as. S CU. Uh, he was formerly the director of research at MUFON from 2007 to 2017. He created MUFON's scientific review board in 2012. He co-authored UFOs and Government, a historical inquiry in July of 2012 as well. 2012 was a big year for you, Robert. Uh, he also wrote a children's book, uh, The Truth About UFOs, a Scientific Perspective. He's also writing a, a new book, which will be released about April of next year. And that one will be called UFOs, a Scientist Explains What We Know and Don't Know. Did I say that correctly for the title, Robert? Yes, you did. Yeah. Perfect. Well, Robert, thank you so much for uh, joining Michael and I today on UAP Studies. We really appreciate it. Well, I'm glad to be here. Great. So first and foremost, uh, everybody usually has an origin story when it comes down to UFOs, what got them interested, because let's face it, this is a bit of a niche market. And, you know, for people like ourselves has been at it for quite some time, ridicule and being mocked is has always been part of the game. So to pursue the scientific pursuit um, of looking into this, there's got to be a drive. There's got to be something that that pushes you to do that. So out of curiosity, Robert, like what got you interested in all of this? So it, I, I've never seen a UFO myself. As I always say, I get I guess the uh, aliens don't like me. But, uh, <laughs> but Now, what got me interested in it? Uh, when I was a teenager, I read uh, Dr. J. Allen Hynek's book, uh, The UFO Experience. And uh, it's written in a scientific type perspective. And so that really got my attention. But, you know, you, high school's before you, then college after that, then you get married, then you, you know, raise a family, get a job, all of those things. So I did not have time for UFOs during that time frame. Um I had got my degree in chemistry, and then I, I began to work in the uh, semiconductor field as a, a product and a process engineer. And I was lucky in that I was able to retire early. So then it was like, okay, what would I like to do? So I, I started making my list of things. And one of them was, you know, recheck out that subject UFOs. So this was in 2006. And so that that's what I did. I decided, okay, I want to see if there's any reality to this. And that's how I began uh, studying the subject. And I've been actively studying it for the last 16 years, 17 years. Wow. Yeah, that's yeah. a good stretch of time. So is there a, is there any reality to the subject? How, how Where did you land on that, Robert? So I actually landed on there is reality of the subject within a year of studying uh, the topic. And uh, in my mind, there's no doubt that it's a physical, you know, these are actual physical objects and that they're intelligently controlled. But beyond that, I can't really draw a lot of conclusions. What was the compelling else. evidence? How did you come to that conclusion? Like what tipped you over the edge? Well, the what tipped me over the edge on the, the intelligence that they're intelligently controlled is I had read so many military cases out of Project Blue Book where the the object interacted with the aircraft. So that plus the fact that these objects are capable of accelerating at extreme speeds, which by definition, um, there are a few times in nature where acceleration can be great, um, but Normally, that requires intelligence in order to, you know, create that extreme acceleration. So that's what led me to those conclusions. Mm. What's fascinating for me about 
the study of these objects and the way that they fly is that they'll go from not moving at all to instantaneous speed. It's, there's no build up to it. It's just instant. Uh, you know, you start your car, you need to build up because zero to 60. We all know that. Right. So, but with these objects, they don't do that. They just go from standstill to gone. And as a, as a person knowing what gravity is or what sh it should be doing and watching my fair share of movies, I've never been in a plane, uh, but you feel the G forces. And I can only imagine that being still to moving like that would just turn a human into jelly. There's no way it's human made. So when we keep hearing, well, this could be, russia or china i think at this point we've fairly eliminated that question that it's not china it's not russia if it was russia ukraine would not be still fighting the war and i don't if china had it there's no way that we would not be talking chinese right now right so we could eliminate that but when you're looking at uh, as a sign as a scientist you know basically what we know so far about the reality of life what should work what shouldn't work what's the biggest key here that doesn't seem to make sense like on a scientific level for you uh, part of this like, i mean there's a lot of them that don't make sense but what key point for you is like that doesn't make any sense well i guess i look at science a little different so to me it, it's never that it doesn't make sense it's just okay, well, what is it that I don't understand about science or how can we explain what it's doing, right? So right. when I ex see an extreme acceleration, um, it may not make sense in terms of the our engineering capability of doing that, but I, I still look at it as, okay, how, how can we figure this out? You know, what exactly is going on that allows this craft, to, you know, to do that? Right. And, yeah. and what is it that you think is going so so f f maybe first it would be best to say that i'm maybe more of an outsider to this topic than you and jason are i came to it fairly recently within what, maybe five years or so and i also come to it from a humanities perspective rather than a pure science perspective and as a philosopher to me i kind of like to divide claims or information into a few buckets there's like one bucket of claims that are just unquestionable right like so when we say for instance that um there are objects that seem like they can just instantaneously accelerate um they can pull five g's within a, a second or two or something that to me seems like a claim that is not open for skepticism right I mean, it seems like we have locked down that some such thing exists based on all of our military sensor data um but then there are other claims like that they're being intelligently controlled which seems like uh, an inference maybe it's true or maybe it's the best explanation for what we see but it's at least possible to argue against that would you agree with that first of all well i i look at it a little bit different michael i um Take, for example, if let's assume I did, had no idea what an airplane was and I saw an airplane flying through the sky for the first time, I, I would I would be fairly confident that was intelligently controlled. Um, and when I have an object that can go from standing still to suddenly accelerating out of my sight within two seconds, for example, then I, I feel confident it's intelligently controlled. Uh, because, and the reason I say that is I'm not aware of any living creature that can do that or any type of uh, atmosphere. Yeah, that can do that. So that's so, why. I've... Absolutely. But, but, on, but even in, in, in saying that, you're distinguishing between the thing that you've observed, which is unquestionable. You know that you've seen this pattern of acceleration. And the other thing, which is an inference, which seems almost impossible almost certain but it's not exactly at the same level as like we've observed it and nobody can even argue about that and, and it seems helpful to me to make that distinction out front because there are people who i think probably listen to the podcast and are trying to figure out well what is the what are the facts that we know we have that nobody can dispute and what are the inferences that people are making based on other beliefs that they might have about in the nature of intelligence or or extraterrestrials or non-human intelligences or whatever which they might not believe in and i think that part of what compelled me to come into the 
field is the fact that this bucket of things that are just irrefutable or observations about flight characteristics, or it's not exactly even flight, um, you know, aerial maneuver characteristics of objects seem just uh, undeniable. Like we know that this, this exists and there has to be some explanation for it. And we don't have that explanation. And it seems like you came to the same position because you wrote this um, paper estimating flight characteristics of anomalous UAP with Kevin Knuth and Peter Reale. And I read that paper uh, w within a few months from now. Um, but I thought that you came to some really startling conclusions in the end of that. And I was wondering if you could kind of outline what that paper did and, and what you guys came to conclude on. The uh, well, the, I mean, the, the main thing we did in that paper is we took, like we did a, a very large report on the USS Nimitz and USS Princeton incident of 2004. And so that's like a monograph we wrote that's one, 200 pages long. But what we did in this paper is we looked at a specific issue, which was the acceleration characteristics of the craft. And so we looked at it in terms of, we had three instances where this object Except exhibited extreme acceleration within basically a four hour time window. Now that's very unusual because there have been cases in history where, okay, here's one incident. Uh, a pilot sees an object, it's close to him in two seconds, it's gone. Well, that's a potential example of extreme acceleration. But in this case, we had three examples. We had statements from two independent individuals on the USS Princeton who were observing the radar system. And so this is anecdotal, but this is them saying, this is, these are the values the radar system indicated, you know, mm -hmm. basically time and distance, which we can calculate acceleration from. The second case was the video that everyone's seen where the object suddenly disappears from the video. And, and there's actually an instance in that video that's even faster that we didn't talk about in the paper. But uh, I, maybe I'll go into that after a little while. But the third instance, and I think is the strongest instance, is where we had two F-18 jets with two Naval Academy graduates in each jet. So you've got four guys. One with Commander Fravor is actually engaging this unknown tic-tac so he's moving towards it the other jet which had the lieutenant commander uh slate and uh, uh alex dietrich who was flying the plane they're sitting at twenty thousand feet so they have a totally different perspective and when this object suddenly begins to turn and, and accelerates one of the thing and disappears in two seconds basically or maybe one second uh, the one thing you always ask is, well, did it really disappear? Could it, you know, the glisten of the sun, could, uh, you know, it gone behind a cloud, could, you know, did something else happen and it didn't really disappear from sight in two seconds? Because that's, we base those acceleration numbers in that instance on the fact of how fast it disappeared, what the human eye can see, and we can calculate how far it has to go to disappear. So, but all those things that make you wonder, did it really disappear? Those are eliminated when you've got two, two observers from two different perspectives looking at it. So mm -hmm. now, you know, the glint of the sun, uh, all of those are eliminated. And, and you're left with a situation of it actually traveled a distance where it was so far away, you could no longer see it. And, and so, last question: What are the what are the actual flight characteristics that that object exhibited in in those three sort of observational instances? Like, what do we know about that thing? So the 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 key flight characteristic is it is it displayed the ability to basically go from standing still to. It, accelerating depending on the particular case anywhere from a hundred to a thousand g-forces and, and the aircraft a, a normal aircraft will break apart at 15 g-forces you and i will pass out at six g-forces at a hundred to a thousand g-forces we're just going to be liquid mush any aircraft 
that moved at that acceleration and at those speeds, which was in tens of thousands of miles per hour, would become a fireball in the atmosphere due to the friction. But none of but that didn't happen. And we don't, you know, we don't know how an object can accelerate to the lower atmosphere at that kind of speed. Uh, so that that's the I'd say those are the two key characteristics uh, that this exhibited. One was acceleration, two was the ability to not interact with the atmosphere. And this is exactly the sort of information that kind of pushed me over into thinking there's there's actually a there there, but because it seems like whatever interpretation you have of it, it doesn't really matter. We know that these observations do take place and that they're veridical, they're reliable. So there's something out there that's doing things we just can't do. I mean, it should melt in the middle of the air from the just from the friction alone. I think that's just startling. It's but. not just that they could do that in the air, but they'll make, you know, right angle turns. They'll just like all of a sudden at, at that speed or they'll uh, go mm. into the water. It's like, oh, I, I'm blown away personally. I don't know anything that can do that. Like that's human made. I always make the joke that I'm 42 years old. I have 42 years of experience being a human. I'm a human expert at this point. And I don't think any of that technology, I mean, I, I had a close encounter when I was a kid and that thing was not man-made. There's no way it was man-made. Uh, and it sort of solidifies for anybody who's ever seen one or experienced one in, in the case of you know military of officials, you know for a fact that we are way, way under that pay grade. We are not meant to know that like, they're way above us. And what fascinates me is that the speed of which you're describing, uh, Mr. Powell, that these things are able and capable uh, of achieving. We have thousands of planes in the sky at any given moment, right? Even now as we speak or as you're listening to this podcast, there's thousands of them. And all these pilots reporting these near misses or close calls with these objects. And yet we haven't really had a confirmed down aircraft because of a crash or collision with something that is in the sky so whatever they're doing what whoever their pilots are they're amazing at avoiding you know, catastrophes in the air and that that shows intelligence if it was a drone I, drones mm. can make those decisions That's so a good point. yeah there seems to be definitely an intelligence behind it um one theory that i i, I want to uh discuss with you uh mr powell is that some people claim with alien abduction cases, and, and I'm huge in alien abduction cases, that's where I specialize in or want to specialize in, but a lot of them describe sometimes being able to fly the craft or that they're shown how to fly the craft, and it's based on consciousness, that their consciousness is extended to the, the craft itself, and that these crafts are, are basically the consciousness of the driver. So that's why they're able, like even uh, Fravor was mentioning as he was descending down, this thing almost looked like it it knew it was coming behind him. Like it turned around and then started doing its counter move. It's quick. It's almost at the speed of thought. These things could, you know, you're mentioning the speed at which they go. It's like the speed of thought. I want to be here. And there you are. That Like you just go. It's amazing that we have no air collision with actual aircrafts. Do you have any theories on that, sir? Oh, uh, as to why we have never collided uh, with the UFO. Uh, well, for one thing that I look at is, right, we don't know that absolutely, because I guess if, if you did Good have point. a collision and your plane was destroyed, we would never know. Uh, but it at least as all the evidence today indicates that there's never been a collision. And so I would, if I had to guess, and it would be a guess, would probably be that, um, you know, just like us, right, they, they're capable of avoiding collisions. And they're, I would assume anyone with that level of technology is better than we are at avoiding collisions. Right. I think it was, so, uh, Abby, sorry, Mike, uh, Abby ahead. Loeb, we, have, we had him on a while back, and he was saying that, he believes that a uh, a spacefaring civilization would have to be peaceful by nature because if they're hostile, let's say ourselves, we meet another group of aliens, eventually we end up picking a fight or a fight ensues. But to be able to survive in a galactic way to be able to go from planetary system to system, you'd have to be fairly peaceful and not aggressive. Uh, so far, as far as we can tell from all the activity that we've been recording for the last 90 years 
it seems to be rather peaceful. I mean, I know there's human deaths related to this, but it, it seems rather peaceful. I mean, people are brought back. Um, the engagement that we have with our military aircrafts with these um, objects, so far they haven't shown any aggression, which to me gives me hope that maybe we're dealing with, uh, you know, a peaceful civilization and that uh, if any aggression comes, it, it will be from our end, not theirs. I'll quickly interject I, I would, before Robert answers yeah. that I don't understand that argument that Abby makes at all. I mean, maybe it's true, at all, but it just doesn't make any sense to me as it's been presented why it, we would have it would have to be peaceful. Um, but I, I don't want to make a point about that. I just want to like bookmark it for later if we need. But please go ahead, Robert. Well, actually, I was going to comment on that part of, of, of what Jason said. Michael was uh, I I suspect that they're peaceful, but not for the reason. Abi mentioned, um, but for a slightly different reason. And using us as an example, although I try not to be uh, too human centric, right? Because other things may not operate like we do at all. But if you look at our civilization, we developed the capability of destroying ourselves about sixty years ago. We do. We will not have the capability of interstellar travel probably for at least 200 more years. If you assume most civilizations, the same thing happens, that they're able to destroy themselves before they can travel to the stars, then your malevolent or, or civilizations that are aggressive are more likely to destroy themselves before they ever leave their planet. Mm -hmm. and, and we're in that situation today. Right. Oh, boy. If, yeah. If we, can, if <laughs> yeah. we can make it to the stars, then we will have to become more peaceful. Otherwise, we'll probably be gone before that time ever comes. So that's why I think it's more likely that, uh, you know, they're benevolent or, and peaceful. Hmm. Um, now, that doesn't mean that they have to be right. And just because nothing has happened in 80 years doesn't mean necessarily that they're peaceful although it improves the odds because i see everything in shades of gray so i just think it's highly likely that they're peaceful but there's no guarantee that they are good points i can i can understand that argument much better i mean it, it's uh, it i have i have questions about it i'm totally unsettled on what i think about the the nature or likelihood of of peaceful Give, you know, some random alien civilization being peaceful or not. I have no idea what to think really about it. But um, one wrapping back to some of the things we were talking about, about the flight characteristics of these objects and what we can like sort of infer from them. Uh, we've had to, in order to like pursue that question of like what we can infer about the flight characteristics, we've had to kind of like start defining what we mean by a ufo much more precisely now that there's like legislation and and offices to report ufo and uap um and that has created a kind of wonky nomenclature now where we have like okay they're ufos or they're uaps and there's a uap office over here and we're the uap podcast and you're the head of sc uap and i'm and but then we a sometimes means anomalous and sometimes it means aerial. And for people who are trying to get into this, like, why did we abandon UFO in favor of UAP? Did we actually make that choice? Um, what are the advantages and disadvantages of these nomenclature? And like, how do we move forward to talk about these things in a sensible way? Yeah, that, that's a, a great question. So for the audience, it's not familiar maybe with the recent history. Um, in the very beginning, these objects were called flying saucers. And then there, there was a lot of uh, uh, stigma that developed around that term. And so they changed, the Air Force changed the term to UFO, unidentified flying object. And then stigma developed with that term in the late 1950s and continued on to modern day. And the reason UAP came into existence, and so you don't really have to worry about, was it aerospace, was it anomalous? The, the basic thing is let's change the term away from UFO to get out of the stigma. Um, we did that with NSCU. 
we, we had a long debate. Are we the scientific coalition of ufology or are we the scientific coalition of UAP studies? And we fell on the side of UAP because we're a scientific group and UFO had too much stigma. The, the other example is the UAP task force, which the government ran. A guy by the name of Jay Stratton headed up the UAP task force from uh, roughly 2015 all the way to 2021. He's th He did a lot of the briefing of Congress. And he had stated the reason that he changed the word to UAP and, and that's why they're called the UAP task force and not a UFO task force was he did not want, he did not think he had much chance of going to Congress and briefing them on UFOs mm. because of all the little green men, the little gray men stigma that's attached to the word UFO. And so that's why we ha now have the word UAP. So there's like two sides to it. There's the, the technical verbiage side where it's like, um, People might be concerned that uh, unidentified flying objects isn't technically correct because some of these objects don't fly, they hover, or they they don't seem to propel themselves in the way that we think of as necessary for flight. They don't have flight surfaces that give them lift or whatnot. Um, but then maybe it seems like the the consideration that has had the most power over it are really just these like rhetorical questions about whether people laugh when you bring up the word UFO and that is what you think has like kind of pushed the verbiage the most? Yes, absolutely. I th I'm, I'm positive. That's what's pushed it the most was the uh, rhetoric, not the uh, science behind it. Fascinating. Science isn't just the sort of like abstract rational world of, you know, calculating about, you know, physics or whatever. It's, it's bound up with rhetoric and considerations about public opinion and things just as much as anything. I think that's a, a beautiful uh, demonstration of that. Yep. Yeah. And, and scientists have their own prejudice just like everyone else. Well, even before we uh, we logged on, I was talking with uh, with Michael about uh, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson. Did I say correctly this time, Michael? Is that how you say? I his think name? it's just Neil deGrasse Tyson, but I don't know. Neil deGrasse. If he, that's that's he's why he's never I'm corrected me when I've said it because he doesn't know who I am. <laughs> but um, I think we're free to say whatever we want. Yeah, but you know what? Like he he's so like against the idea that these are possible visitors from somewhere else whether extra direct uh, extra uh, terrestrial or interdimensional whatever they may be but he's so adamant that it's impossible now this guy studies planets and solar systems and yet he can't even imagine that this is a possibility uh it seems like there's there's a bit of a divide among scientists where scientists are saying yes this is there's possibly very much valid points to this. And then others that are just, it's almost like a dogmatic approach. They're just, they're so set in the old ways that it's impossible to think outside the boundaries of that. Have you found that with your colleagues in the scientific community? Like there's some that's more open than others. Yeah. I mean, it just like the same is true with, you know, the average citizen. Uh, some people are more open than other people. Uh, in the case of, um neil degrasse tyson if i pronounced it right uh i think that the biggest problem i have with what he says is he has never to my knowledge ever really studied the subject mm. he he's basically espousing his ideas without studying the subject i mean so he has a phd in physics if i recall correctly or maybe it was astronomy um would he make statements on a question related to sociology or biology, right? I don't think he would because that's outside of his sphere of education. Normally he would say, well, I'm not a sociologist. You need to go ask a sociologist. But mm -hmm. here in this subject, he feels like he is an expert and can give an expert opinion. Uh, there was a study done by Dr. Peter Sturick of Stanford uh, back in see the 60s or the 70s. And what he did is he um, surveyed a large number of astronomers. And what he asked them was, were questions about how open they were to whether or not UFOs needed to be scientifically studied. And then he also asked them 
how much had they studied the subject. And on his graph, the less a scientist has studied the UFO subject, the less open and, and more closed-minded they are about it, while the ones who'd studied it more were more open to, to subjects. Right. Just to throw in some some data, Neil deGrasse Tyson, uh, his he has a BA in physics, but his MPhil and PhD are in astronomy, specifically on uh, galactic bulge phenomena. Was his dissertation, and I, I say this without any mockery at all. He is apparently an accomplished jazz, ballet, Afro Caribbean, and Latin ballroom dancer. There you go. So, yeah. props to Neil deGrasse Tyson. He's got moves. Yes, <laughs> for being a little, uh, more more broad than than we suspected. But I, I think I agree with you. I don't see a lot from him in the sort of YouTube clips or whatever that I've seen him talk that suggests that he has a rich knowledge of the background of the phenomena, probably because he assumes that there's just no there there. That he probably thinks that there are no good books to be read on UFO. And to, to be honest, five years ago, I thought the same thing. I mean, I had some sort of latent interest in it, but I wouldn't have known where to look to find a good book on it. And in fact, the book that got me in to taking the phenomena seriously it was because i was looking through a catalog from oxford university press had sent me and i saw that they published diana walsh pasulka's book american Cos cosmic and i thought oh my god oxford has published a book on ufos i have to buy this because now i know there's something to be read so there's i mean this is a a, a public rhetoric problem with the ufo community already is that people who have interest, probably a lot of them are stuck in a place where they just don't know how to find good information. They don't even know if it exists or not. That's a good point. That's a good point. Would you, you know, would you recommend like a, a book, Robert, for, like, let's say somebody is starting to, to get in, interested, like my, my Michael was saying, and they want to start doing some serious research. Would you have a, a few books in mind that you would pinpoint people to, to, to get them started on this? Well, yeah, if, if, uh, to get someone started, I would, I'd recommend a couple of books. One, the one that I wrote, um, uh, even though I wrote it for kids, uh, a lot of adults have told me that really, that, you know, know nothing about this field, really enjoyed the book. And that was, that's the truth about ufos um is the name of the book um and it's it's like 100 pages real quick read and basically what the book has in it it has a dozen very um uh, interesting cases that are some of the better cases in history and the book just goes into some basic things such as everything is a ufo when you first see it like the first millisecond that your brain sees a jet plane there's a split second you don't really know what it is and it's a ufo until you categorize it and that's true for everything we see um but what's left are the ones that you know are are the true ufos that we can't categorize them and we're confident of the information that we have in the end that we have sufficient information that we should be able to categorize them so that's a good book another good book i think is also Heinick's book mm. uh the ufo experience uh, i don't think it's too uh complicated um a, a third one i would recommend is peter sturick's book the ufo enigma and i i think that's a good book to read now if someone wants a very more collegiate uh reference book uh the book we wrote ufos and government a historical inquiry that's like 600 pages of an 8 by 11 uh textbook and it, it goes through the way the government reacts with the phenomenon over history yeah and, and all over the world not just the united states yeah because it fantastic. is yeah because yeah, we put is, those in the episode description yeah i i wrote them down but uh yeah maybe we'll make a checklist at the end we'll write them down in the uh, uh description as well uh i was going to say with the governments that's the biggest problem too that we face only in the scientific community like yourselves but working together globally on this issue would be the best way to go about this but we all know that's not going to happen because everything is classified when it comes down to governments 
Russia is not going to release to the United States their information on this, nor is the United States going to release to China their information on this. But this is a, an issue that should be globally looked at. Um, I often say that you know when we see like a company that's trying to think outside the box and they invite the public, the general population to help them out solve a problem, and they do because there's brilliant people in the world there's you know that, that are willing to help out and if we did that with ufology extended it so everybody can contribute we'd get further along faster than classifying everything and just having people compartmentalized to work on this and you work on that like it's so complex that it requires more people than we actually have right now working on it but it's great to see the scientific community like taking the helm on this and going we're not going to wait. We're not going to wait till the government okays this. We're going to look into it. And that's why the Scientific Coalition for UOP Studies is so cool, is that you guys just wear your emotions right on your sleeve. Like, let's just do this, right? Don't care about the mockery. Don't care about any insults. Let's just get to work. Uh, a question I have for you, Mr. Powell, is, um, again, talking about the activity not only in our skies, in our waters, uh, but people claiming abductions or people having one-off experience where they see occupants of the crafts. And I'm talking about aerial school, um, of course, that uh, took place in 1994. So people do see the occupants of the uh, of the craft and they describe them as not human looking, being capable of communicating telepathically. But it sounds like it's going to take a long while even for Congress to come to terms with describing the entities that fly these crafts. It seems like we're just admitting that these crafts are here. From your understanding, the amount of activity that we have on a daily basis, a yearly basis, even the Navy pilots were saying that they were seeing these things on radar every day for years. How much of an occupation do you think they have here? Oh, uh, let's see. That's a good question, Jason. But before I answer that, I just want to make one quick comment on your Please. national security portion and that is i think what congress could do more than anything would be to allocate specific funding for example to the national science foundation to state that you have to use x amount of dollars for uap uh, programs and, and with your grants so that that would get academia involved in the study of uaps so if we can get the scientific community involved then we can begin to take it away out of the military slash national security arena because mm -hmm. that's a that's more of a closed information system and science needs an open information system Good point. Um, now to to your your question about um you know ufos and in the craft and how often they're here i i don't have a a real good feel for that. We we have about 5,000 reports that come in just the United States every year. Wow. But of those 5,000, there are only maybe 150 of those 5,000 are, are probably real reports. The other are misidentifications of known objects. So then when you deal with those 150, a certain percentage of those, there's just not enough information right. in, for that particular incident to be able to say, you know, was this truly, you know, potentially a, uh, a craft from somewhere else? Um, for me, it's the cases where the object's very close to the witness um, and it exhibits, you know, something like extreme acceleration, something like that for me to know, okay, this is a very good example of a potential intelligence that was here in our atmosphere. And I, I'm just going to, to guess it's just a handful a year would be my guess. But the, the problem is we, we don't really have the data to be able to answer that question properly. Yeah, even though globally, I wonder what the numbers. I mean, we're not going to get that anytime soon, but just globally, like the amount of activity that takes place, it's it's amazing. And I keep thinking, like, would it be easier for them to just light travel to come here to do one trip, 
or do they have a base nearby that's just easier for them to come and go as they please? And that brings about a whole new question, because if they have a base, where is it? <laughs> I'm curious now. I want to know. Is it in the ocean? It's behind the moon? Where is it? Uh, it? But I'm always curious about that, because space is so vast that even if they could travel at light speed, it would still take a long time to arrive to their destination. So they would have to have some sort of operation closer to us. I mean, if they're interested in us and are constantly here, they would have to have their base of operations fairly close to be able to come here and as they want. I mean, that's a possibility. Um, but since we don't know how they travel, you know, it's, it's point. difficult to, you know, to say. Yeah. Um, Do you have leanings in that regard? Like, I mean, what, so what we have is, a set of observations that suggest that there's some intelligently controlled um, objects. We're, we tend to kind of think of them as craft, but I don't think we have evidence, sufficient evidence in those observations to tell us whether they're craft or something else that we might not have the right category for. But we have those observations, and behind that are all of these inevitable questions like what's controlling them, where are they controlling it from, do they have occupants, are they remotely controlled, or are they themselves intelligent somehow? Are we looking at a being more than a craft? Um, or are they, you know, are they are they psychical in nature somehow? Are they transdimensional? All those questions seem so speculative at this point that it kind of, I can feel like the bristles on the back of my neck, kind of saying, "Oh, you're wandering into like silly land here," but they're not because it's you have to eventually ask some of those questions. And I know that you don't have answers to them, but given all that you've seen, I mean, you've been involved in this for you know, since the seventies, I think. So well, no, I've been studying it for sixteen to seventeen years. Yeah. Okay. So, so given that breadth of experience, do you have leanings, and not not definitive positions that you hold, but leanings in one direction or another towards answers to any of those questions, like what the basic nature of these things is? Yeah. So, so my leaning is that they are from another solar system, rather than interdimensional or time travelers or anything like that. Now, Why? Why Why that instead of time travel or interdimensionality or that they've always been here? Right. And the, and the, the why for me is because we've already discovered 6,000 extrasolar planets. And, and that's with a very limited capability. The, the actual number is probably going to be in hundreds of thousands of extrasolar planets. So and because life is so, you know, so common throughout the universe that that is why, you know, I believe it's most likely uh, by extra, I mean, extraterrestrial just means not of the earth, which mm -hmm. another dimension would be extraterrestrial. But I think it's more likely from other solar systems because of that. Now, doesn't mean it has to be. The, the others could be just as true. It's just that I fall on the, the side of that one because there's so many planets out there that we know of now. Do you tend to think that they have, that these objects have somehow found a loophole around the, the limit of speed being the, the speed of light? Yeah, I think uh, either they've found out how to, to warp through, you know, a, a, a tunnel in space, uh, like a war, a wormhole type situation. They've, that's what I suspect. Uh, I mean, it's possible that they're just traveling at near light speeds, but I would suspect that they're doing it faster than than light speeds. And near near light speeds, if they're traveling to the closest star systems, it would be, you know, a handful of years one way. Um, and we can imagine beings that are sufficiently, um, I don't know, have sufficient control over their own biology or minds or something that maybe a four year trip wouldn't be as taxing or as much of an impediment as it would be for us who have to like you know sleep only eight hours a day or or something um but yeah so you, actually you, go ahead it wouldn't be it wouldn't be taxing at all actually because if they're near light speed like alpha centauri is 40 light years away so if we were observing their craft it would take four years to four get years. here yeah. mm. but for them depending on how close to the speed of light they were they're at because the closer they are to the speed of light, the the more time slows down. Um, so for uh, so for them, it could be two hours to go from Alpha Centauri to us. 
And that yeah. two hours would basically be the the acceleration and slowdown speed approaching the speed of light, right? Because once you get there, it's like nearly instantaneous or something. Right. Once you got to the speed of light, time stops. So now you don't age at all. But um, th this is that twin paradox that Einstein talked about. You know, one goes off, comes back, and he's 10 years that his you know twin is ten years older than him, and for him he's gone a week. It's that same concept. So for them, they could go, leave Alpha Centauri, come here, go back to Alpha Centauri. A week goes by, eight years goes by here, and eight years goes by on Alpha Centauri. Uh, so if you had a true nomadic civilization, right, then you could go all over the galaxy. Uh, the, your problem is when you get back to your home world. Everybody else. A thousand years could have gone by and everyone's gone. Sure. <laughs> yeah. And and it seems like in the conclusion of that paper estimating the flight characteristics of anomalous UAP, you come to the conclusion that the observations we make suggest that the, that sort of acceleration capacity is exactly what these uh, these objects have, is the ability to creep up to the speed of light pretty fast. And then it decelerate pretty fast too, so that they could make a subjectively from their pr perspective a very quick trip between you know right. four or five light years away or something. Right. Amazing. I uh, I'm a huge fan of Bob yeah. Lazar. I think that Bob Lazar is telling the truth from the start. Always have. Um, people have different uh, ideas on him, but now with Grush coming forward. And saying, no, indeed, the United States does have reverse engineering program. In fact, we have recovery programs, craft recovery programs. This is why when the balloons went down um, earlier this this year, I thought it was ridiculous. I said, oh, no, it's too far. We can't. We can't. These guys could go in the Himalayan mountains and retrieve a craft if they wanted to. Like that operation, they know what the hell they're doing. So if something lands in the water, it's not a problem. They'll go get it. So I thought it was funny when they said, no, no, they crashed, but we can't, we don't have the evidence. We don't know. It's like, dude, you have retrieval programs. That's what you do. But hearing that now, uh, that we are trying to reverse engineer this technology that is not from here, it's not homo sapien technology. How confident are you, Mr. Powell, that we're able to even reverse engineer to the capabilities of being able to replicate how they fly with our own technology? And do you believe Grush and and to some good question Lazar? Are you yeah. in the same place? Yeah. So Lazar, I, I don't believe, and I don't believe it myself, but simply because element one hundred fifteen lasts for one millisecond or less, um, and that element did not exist when he was first talking about it. Now we know about the element, but it's like all of them when they're that heavy that they, they they're length of existence is just very momentary uh additionally i've had uh two individuals uh both jay staff uh, stratton who's the head of the government uap task force at brief congress as well as how put off uh, both of those gentlemen you know believe that we have craft that, in our possession but both of them also do not believe that bob lazar is correct in anything he says. So, so that's my answer on Bob Lazar for Gr uh, Grush. Um, I'm 50 50 on that is, is to where, mm -hmm. and, and if you had asked me that one year ago, I would have said I was less than 1%. Um, the only reason I'm, I'm 50 50 is I know so many people, um, you know, such as how put off for Jace, uh, Stratton, who say, yeah, what Rush, I mean, uh, Grush is saying is correct. Um, the what I wonder though is, I mean, is what I want to see because it's secondhand information. What I, so the only thing that he talked about that would convince me are the government documents, so I would want to to see these SAP documents that talk about what the government has and what they've done. But of course, the problem is we won't get to see those. And probably, I don't even know if Congress will get to see them because those are highly classified type documents. So I'm not sure that we'll ever be able to resolve 
Grush's claims. Those I are the documents that are hidden by Title 50. Is that correct? Uh, yes. They're, they're, you have to have a certain uh, need to know in order to see the documents. Uh, so I, I don't, I'm not even sure how Grush was able to see the documents, you know, but apparently he was. Um, Is there so, any legislative door to getting the Senate committee that's responsible for looking at this, giving them access to the things that are covered by Title 50, or is that a non-starter, you think? I, I think the only way Congress will get to see those documents is if they threaten the military by cutting off their budget, some of their budgets. That's. I think they would have to go to that extent, and I don't know that they will, right, because all your representatives and your senators, their states all have various gigantic military defense contractors in their state. And so there's all of these pressures that can be put on the congressman. So I'm, I'm hoping Congress will be successful, but I'm, I'm not, you know, overly optimistic on that. And there's a sense now, in which title, the things that are hidden by Title 50 are actually hidden for the uh, out of out of interest of the well-being of Congress people, right? Because you have Congress people come in who serve like a six year term and then are out. And if you're reading them into programs that make them targets for other intelligence communities for the rest of their lives, that's kind of not a good place for them to be in, right? I mean, there are certain facts about what the United States government's doing that if Russia knew that you had been read in on them, you'd probably need to worry forever that you're being surveilled or that you might even be, I don't know, kidnapped or bribed or or something, Um so it's it, it seems much hairier than on the surface it might actually look. Right. Well, here's something to think about on that one, Michael. Is uh, there's what they have they call the, the gang of eight, right? So th those are the heads of, in the Senate and the House of Representatives. One of them is Chuck Schumer, who's the the majority uh, whip of the Senate, and he is. He put forth the UAP legislation that's tied to the current National Defense Authorization Act of 2023. So because he's part of the Gang of Eight, that means he is allowed to see a SAP program. All the black uh, programs that the military is allowed to hide, the Gang of Eight is allowed to see them, right? So if what Grush is talking about, if Schumer had been aware of it, right, let's assume Schumer was aware of it, then Schumer would have said to the rest of his his fellow congressmen, hey, I know about this. You guys just cool it. Um, I've already seen. I know what's going on. You need to leave it alone. Right. But that's not what he did. He He's the guy who headed up what, the amendment, which tells mm. me that he's ticked off. Right. It's like, hey, I'm supposed to know about everything and whether this has anything to do with, you know, a crashed alien spaceship or not. I'm supposed to know about those SAP projects and you guys are hiding this behind my back. So I think, you know, I think he's ticked about it. And that might lead to, you know, some information coming out. I don't know. Just to clarify for listeners, SAP projects are special access programs. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Right. And, 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 and yeah, let me clarify a little more. You have, uh, uh, you know, confidential, secret, top secret, and then a SAP program, uh, special access program. It's like it's a siloed program. And so, for example, let's say the B-2 bomber when it was being developed, you might have had a SAP program that all it looked at was how do you keep radar beams from bouncing off a uh, you know, craft, right? Mm -hmm. So even the guys within that SAP program would not know that what they're working on was for a B-2 bomber. All they know is about that, right? And then they have all these different SAP programs that piece together. You come up with the B-2. So know, silos bomber. within silos, it sounds like. Right, yeah. Yeah. And no matter what your secrecy level, even if you have top secret clearance, you're 
are not able to see that SAP program unless you have a need to know. So you, the guy who runs that SAP program has to determine that you have a need to know about what's in there. So these are things even the president himself doesn't have any access to for, for some of the reasons the president can only serve for a maximum of eight, eight years. And so you'd have people being read into all sorts of extremely sensitive secret right. programs that then go out and that's not good for, for the country. Yeah. Chase. Yeah. yeah. Well, I was going to yeah. say just with these programs, there's no accountability. There's no oversight. Uh, even when they ask rush, how are they funding these things? He goes misappropriations of funds. You think that you're financing such and such program, but you're not. They're grabbing that money and they're funneling it to these. And that in and of itself brings a whole new question of how much accountability does the United States military have to the public and to its own government? Because it sounds like they're going well above and beyond and saying that nobody except the military has a right to know of any of this, which to me is a crime. Um, withholding information from your government, first of all, should be considered an act of treason. And then holding withholding this information of reality, what we're dealing with in this realm, uh, is a crime against humans. Like, we should know what we're dealing with. We have a right to know. As an adult, and I, I don't care about government policy, but as an adult, I think I have a right to know. What world am I living in? What's part of reality? Where am I on the totem pole? That's Fair questions to ask, right? Um, before yeah. we're going to wrap this up here soon, Robert, but I was going to ask you um, for somebody who's in science and would like to get involved in in getting active in, in doing science related to UAPs. What what advice would you give those individuals? Well, the first advice I would give them is to read some books, um, and it sounds like you, you'll have a list on your on your site that they could go read. Um, so that, that would be my very first uh, recommendation is they read some books um, that have a good overview of the history, you know, so don't look at just what's happened in the last 10 years, look at the history of the subject. And then once they have a feel for that, and if they're still interested, um, then I would recommend that, um, you know, they join an organization such as the SCU or the Galileo Project uh, that has other science um, type people in it and, you know, kind of go from there. Nice. And your newest book, Michael, I know you were going to ask him about his newest books. So I'll let you ask his, uh, uh, your questions there, Mike. Oh, your sound, Mike. Give us a rundown on what your newest book is about and who the audience is and what you're trying to, to do for them in it. Right. So this newest book is called UFOs. And then um, it's a scientist talks about what we know and what we don't know. Uh, the book starts off and it's geared towards someone who has probably a science background, but doesn't have to have a science background, but it, is a good critical thinker. And then so basically the book begins by giving you a, a, a history in the first chapter. You know, here's a history of the phenomenon to give a person a flavor of what's been going on. And once I go through the history of it, I, I talk about the reality of the phenomenon, that it's, it's not just a figment of people's imaginations. And in that chapter, I go through some statistics, uh, you know, uh, historically of sightings. And from there, I talk about some of the unusual aspects of the phenomenon, like electromagnetic interference, high acceleration, uh, big light beams that bend. Um, and, and then I begin to talk about how the phenomenon affects humans, how it affects the media, how it affects the government. Right. How it affects someone who actually sees the object. And I, I do that based on uh, experience with people that I've interviewed. Uh, and then it it also talks about what we need to do in the future. Right. Um, how do we extract ourselves from looking at this purely as national security aspect to looking at it more of a scientific academic aspect? Uh, it also talks about anecdotal re reports. For example, um, in science, we normally poo-poo anecdotal reports. 
sure. right? Because oh, okay, that's I can't I can't repeat this measurement. I don't know what it is. Yet we use anecdotal reports in science all the time. For example, when the FDA uh, releases a drug, that drug's released to the entire human population based on 5,000 people who gave their anecdotal feelings about how that drug affected them. And so that's a life-death situation. That's scary. Yeah, that's scary. <laughs> yeah. Another example. Yeah. Uh, a cancer surgeon goes in and operates on your esophagus. And while he's in there, he sees some cancerous tissue. He doesn't first go remove it and test it and then go in and remove it. He removes it right then and there. He'll biopsy it later. So you depend, you put your life in his hands to make this judgment that he thought that might be cancerous and he needed to rip it right on out of you. So and that is itself by definition, just an anecdotal experience. He looked at yeah. one lump of cancer yeah. in your throat and make that decision. Right. And the amazing thing, that same surgeon walks outside, let's say a UFO lands 200 feet away from him and then flies off rapidly. He reports it. No one's going to believe him. It's an annual <laughs> report. <laughs> this is the reason why I wish scientists would read more about the history of science, because the history of science is itself as messy and disorganized and anecdotal uh, as as anything you could imagine. I mean, it's really the the absolute <laughs> apotheosis or antithesis of what uh, what we imagine science to be. Yet it works. I don't think that that was bad science, but um, but science just doesn't have the sort of like formal preciseness that we kind of imagine it does in fourth grade when we're told that there's a scientific method that every scientist applies across every right. discipline that's always the same and stuff so i love that i love that there's a that you're presenting a rational thoughtful discussion of the the value of anecdotal evidence um and there's a, a bunch of topics that we didn't even get to today so i think we should have you back on because i really want to ask Part you about two. religion and and whether there are whether there's a a, a sort of natural and antimony between religion and, and science or between religion and the UAP subject or or if we need to draw the boundaries so that UAP include religious experience too. That's something that's been on my mind a lot lately. And I think that you probably have some penetrating answers to that. So uh, maybe we'll schedule a part two for you to come back. Yeah, I'd love to talk about that. And I'd also love to talk about uh, the hard sciences and soft sciences and how those go get along with UAPs. Well, let's Absolutely. do it. Let's do a part two. Um, what we'll do is we'll shoot you a, a message maybe uh, later today or tomorrow, and we'll try to schedule a, a part two for, for all of us in the audience to be able to listen. Uh, Robert, seriously, sir, it's been an, an honor to be able to talk with you and to be able to, uh, to learn from you. Uh, this is what this podcast is all about. It's about learning from people like yourself um, and, and Michael as well, like learning from all aspects and disciplines because that's what's needed. And we need to keep an open mind on every aspect of this phenomenon until we can find out more information, get more solid footing. We need to look at everything and keep an open mind, not necessarily toss out the baby with the bathwater. Um, we mentioned before, I think on Michael's episode, that philosophy and science used to be together, but it separated at some point. But the UAP subject brings them both back together, which you have no choice but to put them together to make it work, which I absolutely love, which is awesome. So, Robert, thank you so much. Michael, thank you so much for being the co-host today, my man. Absolutely. I appreciate it. Great questions. And for the audience, we're going to uh, obviously add the book titles that Robert mentioned. Uh, also, we're probably going to do a Q&A on this episode on Spotify, so make sure to look for that. We are doing a new YouTube channel as well. So, so the previous YouTube channel won't be uh, your go-to anymore, but we'll uh, give you that information on Twitter and Facebook when that comes about. And again, thank you so much for Robert Powell and Michael Glosson today for uh, coming on the podcast. This has been great. I'm looking forward to part two and uh, we'll catch you guys on flip side. Right, I enjoy guys. talking to you guys. Thanks, Michael. Yeah. Thanks, Jason. Thank you.